On behalf of the Rebuilding Alliance Board of Directors, I am honored to present to you, Dr. Hanan Ashwari, our top Peacemaker Award, which we have called this year the Paresia Award, Speaking Truth to Power. The award is named in reference to the nonviolent act of speaking truth in resistance to oppression. We wish to honor how conscientiously and bravely you have spoken now and over the decades in your many roles on behalf of Palestine and the Palestinian people. Um, thank you. And I want to thank you for being with us and for allowing us to be with you. Um, uh, and um, perhaps I should begin by acknowledging how difficult a period of time this is in Palestine. Uh, following the Trump administration, the Abraham Accords, which undercut the uh, Arab Peace Initiative. Of course, you are very familiar with difficult times. <laughs> um, you can say that again. <laughs> uh, um, you were active politically during your student years. Um, uh, um, you were in Beirut during the War of 67. You were effectively uh, exiled from Palestine from your home at that time. You went on to a doctorate at uh, the University of Virginia. The new Birzeit University wanted to bring you back uh, as a member of the faculty and eventually you were able to return. Um, we noticed that your training was not in politics. You're, you're so well known for your, your political roles, but your, your training like mine <laughs> was in literature, yeah, uh, uh, in English literature and in comparative literature. And uh, you became professor and chair of the English department at Birzeit University, the first of the Palestinian universities. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in your literary background and its relationship to your activism. And it fits in with the title of our award, the Greek term Parasia from Greek philosophy and Greco-Roman culture and from the period of the early church fathers uh, means roughly free or frank speech, a speech act in which truth is the most important thing and which may carry some risk for the speaker. So I would like to ask you if we could um, to say something about how your literary interests and your literary training have influenced you in your roles as a speaks as a spokesperson for the Palestinian cause. Um, well, I've always said that. First of all, thank you very much. I didn't get the chance to thank you uh, and to thank Rebuilding Alliance for this wonderful award. I will treasure it, uh, and I will keep it, and I will always value it because uh, no matter uh, what you do, getting this recognition is always. Uh, Empowering, and it's a source of validation that you're not uh, going unnoticed and that there are people who, who help and who do uh, understand what you're going through. So thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be with you again. You. And uh, yes, you and I uh, do share a background in literature. While you remained in that field, you married your activism with your literary uh, endeavors uh, and scholarship, which is... Uh, actually something I try to do because my my love has always been academia, research, writing, literature. Uh, and unfortunately, like most Palestinians, sometimes you do not have the luxury of choice. Uh, I wrote about how reality intrudes and intervenes and imposes on you responsibilities and challenges and risks that you have to take. And I think all Palestinians in many ways have to make this existential choice. Do we want to be passive victims of a very abnormal and unjust and painful reality, or do we want to roll up our sleeves and try to change this reality and, and stand up to injustice and oppression and attempts at silencing and dehumanizing the Palestinians? So I, in many ways, I managed to, I think, uh, marry both my my literary uh, uh, commitments. I don't want to say career because I'm not teaching these days as much as I would like to. 
uh, and uh, my activism, whether as a student or as a faculty member or as dean, or, uh, and as spokesperson somehow, since you are used to dealing with the word uh, and you understand the power of the word, uh, I, I used to talk about Peso as the goddess of persuasion. Many people look at her as being, you know, more gentle or, or uh, seductive and so on. But I think of her as an extremely powerful and formidable goddess, uh, like Peregia. It has power. She, uh, she has power. And in, in many ways, the word itself is, is, uh, has power and can uh, shape reality. And it's no substitute for action, but it's the trigger for action. Uh, and so um, I, I felt that uh, if you have the power of the word, and I don't want to go back to biblical literature, I was a medievalist as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important that you use it and use it responsibly because you have also the responsibility of truth. And yes. you have the responsibility of maintaining uh, the word in order to ensure that it is not silenced and to ensure that your narrative is not hijacked, confiscated or distorted uh, or forged. So I felt that one major battle we had as Palestinians was to ensure that our narrative is, is out there, that our narrative is uh, validated and, and heard and recognized because the, from the beginning, the attempt at displacing the Palestinians and replacing them with another nation also accompanied with it attempts at erasing, at the erasure of our history, of our narrative, of our culture. And it is still ongoing, not from even before the Nakba, when, when the, the Balfour Declaration decided that we were, uh, they defined us by, by what we are not. They said the non-Jewish population, non -Jewish which was 90% yeah, right. at that time of Palestine. Uh, was non-Jewish, but we were all Palestinians, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. But Balfour decided to call the 90% of the Palestinians uh, by describing the, us in the narrative, the non-Jewish population, and we were called even the non-Jewish communities, and they gave us, you know, uh, uh, some sort of rights, but not freedom or national rights or statehood or whatever. And they gave, and, and with the Balfour Declaration, they gave themselves the right to uh, displace us and replace us with another people. And yes. this paradigm that Ilan Pape talked about, the displacement replacement paradigm, is very important to us because it's not an incident. It's not a one-time thing in history. It's an ongoing process. Huh? And so I saw and I felt and I heard all my life at one point, I wrote that we weren't even allowed to use the term Palestinian. Yes, I, you're writing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ourselves. So the, the language that was used in order to uh, uh, confiscate and abduct our reality and to try to present it through our uh, adversaries um, was a real challenge. That we had to stand up and we had to fight back and we had to say we are here and this is who we are. And with all the, the uh, you know, the, the wealth of our culture, history, identity, not just as victims, but as people who are bent on and determined to get our freedom, our rights, uh, our dignity, and to assert our humanity, not in a de defensive way, but in, an, in a proactive, probably even intrusive way to say we, we, we are here and this is our not. So language was a very important part of it, as was <laughs> activism. So ours was an act of affirmation, uh, and it, and we we combined our resistance, and I've always been engaged in nonviolent resistance and activism and so on. We combined it with the will to speak out, with the, not just the impulse or the urge, but the determination, uh, as I said, not to be silenced and to uh, amplify our voices and to uh, join up with others who are also being silenced, who are also being oppressed. So ours is in many ways a human message, a global message uh, against you, injustice, against you oppression. Had that, you had done that from your student days at the University of Virginia, joining with yeah. the, the black students. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I was uh, invited to attend uh, as an honorary member, uh, our Palestinian sister, they called me, to attend the meetings of the Black Students Alliance. I don't know if they still remember, but it's been some time. Um, but no, I mean, th there was identification and solidarity, certainly, among many. I also want to mention, um, uh, if we go back in time, uh, the Madrid Conference of 1991, uh, there was a debate whether the opening speech from the Palestinian delegation should be in Arabic or in English. And you English. argued for English so that the Americans could understand and the world audience could understand. And you wrote that the speech that uh, Dr. Haider Ab Abul Shafi delivered was the speech that you wrote. Yes. It was a <laughs> groundbreaking, it was a groundbreaking speech. Um, it was eloquent. It was uh, it was based in ethics. It it made a case uh, that appealed to the emotions and it appealed to logic. And um, I think, as you said in the speech, it overcame. It, it was the moment to overcome Palestinian reticence. So mm. it was a it was a time when that story was really heard around the world. Yeah. That's true. I mean, it is a significant speech, and to me, it remains something that's close to my heart because uh, it's something that I wrote while I was in tears, actually. So it's a very honest, a very real speech. It's not manipulative. And in, in, in many ways, it's a language that came out from my experience, from the fact that I was coming from the occupied territories, from occupied Palestine, from a people who were suffering for no fault of their own, and that now we had this platform and we could speak out and we could tell the world, this is who we are. Now that will perhaps bring us to this uh, period, which maybe is a crossroads because we have these long delayed Palestinian elections coming up, um, uh, discussions about uh, reconciliation of the factions or a split in Fatah with two, two possible slates. You had, um, turned in your resignation from the uh, executive committee of the uh, uh, PLO um, in, as a protest. Um, can, you, can you tell us what role you see for yourself going forward or um, what, what positive development you see with the, um, with the coming elections? I said this openly that when I resigned, I didn't resign from my work for Palestine, from my dedication to the cause. I've always worked for Palestine. I've been the most reluctant official, I think. I didn't want to be <laughs> the PLO executive. I didn't want to be a minister. I ran for elections for the Legislative Council, yes. All my positions were elected, by the way. Uh, I believe in that. But uh, somehow I felt when your presence is used as a cover and when you become just a token, and when um, the institution that you're supposed to represent, because the PLO was supposed to represent all the Palestinian people, and the executive committee was the highest decision-making body. And when I saw that our powers were usurped, that decision-making was concentrated in the hands of the few, that our institutions were not respected, that even our rights and, and freedoms were being violated. I tried, I tried for a long time to be a force for change. And as you know, when you speak to truth to power, you don't just speak it to the, your occupiers, you don't just speak it to the Americans or the Europe. You, your first responsibility is to speak it to yourself, to your own people and to your own colleagues. And uh, I felt that self-inflicted wounds are, are much more painful than those inflicted by, by others. And I didn't want to be part of this despite the fact that I felt I should be able to change. And I did speak out and I did constantly try. Unfortunately, I couldn't. So I said, I don't want to be just a front, just a cover. Either I can make a difference or I walk out. And as you know, it wasn't easy, <laughs> especially the men in our political system. They're not used to having anybody walk out, let alone women and let alone independent people. And as an independent, as a woman, as somebody whose main concern is not having a position or money 
<laughs> I've never asked for privilege or money or position, uh, actually. Uh, I, I felt it is my right to make this statement of protest. Yes, I can walk out, but I'm not going to relinquish my responsibility towards the cause and the people. And I've done that. I have uh, established three civil society organizations that are functioning beautifully. And I, I believe in, in working with the people within civil society. I believe also in networking with our allies. Uh, there is a tremendous network of solidarity. In the States, as you know, there are people, whether from Black Lives Matter or the women's movement or uh, the, the academia, you have lots of people in universities, students and so on. You have... Uh, uh, people who are standing up and speaking out and, and who are refusing again to be silenced and who are presenting the Palestinian narrative and linking with us. It's not easy. We know they pay a price. We know that there's a counter movement trying to oppress and suppress and silence also our own uh, allies and the sol solidarity movement. And I know they have their own problems as well. But that is, is mutually invigorating you know, <laughs> for them and for us. Uh, I, know, I know that you are, you've always been interested in um, the training of young people in um, helping, uh, helping them to find a, a role, uh, helping them succeed. <clears throat> Yet from, uh, and when I was, when I was in Palestine, I was, so impressed with young Palestinians um, at Al-Quds University where I was teaching and elsewhere. There's so much talent, uh, so many people with good character, um, with, um, who want to make a contribution and who have leadership ability. And yet it, seems that, and yet it seems that either the, the organization of the Palestinian Authority um, or something has in a way blocked these younger generations. I feel that's my job. I mean, I kept telling people that this uh, system has become ossified. It has become petrified, if you will. It has frozen in time that people, uh, once they get to a position of authority, responsibility or decision-making, they hold on to power, they hold on to, and they exclude others, particularly the marginalized, the women and the young and, and the youth. And as you said, we have such a, a remarkable and amazing uh, generation of young people and uh, a very impressive women's movement. I'm sure you've met many of them. The women's movement in Palestine dates back to the 1890s. People don't understand that it's a long ongoing uh, women's movement that was always politically engaged, not just for women's rights, but they fought against the, the Ottoman occupation, they fought against the British mandate, and they were, so uh, the women have always been there out there and uh, up front, even though, of course, our society as a whole remains male dominated, remains patriarchal and uh, very unfair and discriminatory towards women, but still we do have these amazing women uh, and we have a younger generation that just is, is really dying to, to get their chance huh? to be part of change, to be part of, to, to take Palestine to the future. And as you said, yes, I have mentored quite a few. I have worked with many younger uh, people. I have uh, uh, quite a few interns who worked with me uh, and who trained with me. And I'm always on the lookout for, for young people in order to give them the platform and to, to uh, make room for them. And I've always challenged all the old people. Look, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with being old. It's fine. To me, you earn, I, I said, I lived my life. I earned my years. I earned my gray hair. It's not something that <laughs> happened. So I'm proud of my age. Uh, I lived it. But also, it doesn't give you a monopoly. It doesn't give you a monopoly on the future. It doesn't give you a monopoly on uh, deciding the, the fate of, of people. It doesn't uh, give you license to close doors for others. So I kept saying my job was to open doors for others, particularly for women, but also for the young people in order to be able to take their proper place. Huh? I found very little, if any, cooperation from the older generation. And, and uh, uh, I told them when I resigned, I want to practice what I preach. And I want to say now is the time to 
make room for others and for younger people. So now in the midst of the election you're talking about, and this is again very ironic because we as Palestinians are having elections under occupation when we don't have any freedom. Hmm? And we're having elections when we know that the Israelis can destroy anything at any point. And we do, we have elections in a legacy of, of uh, uh, a division and friction and so on. And we have elections when we've seen a regression in terms of fundamental rights and freedoms. But still, the fact that more than 93, 94% of people have registered for elections ought to tell you how much they want change. How much, how much they want to see uh, a visible and active uh, participation in the political system, not just as people who resist, not just as people who uh, take uh, risks, but also as people who take matters into their own hands. And, and to me, they are the ones who are interested, as I said, with taking Palestine into the future. This is the hope we talk about. This is the hope, which is part of your uh, celebration, <laughs> rebuilding hope. Yes. Uh, it's never less to uh, lost hope because uh, th there's a deep conviction in, in our cause and in our humanity. The moment you lose hope, you know, then, then you, that, that's defeat, it seems to me. But when you have hope, when you have confidence, when you have the will, to persist and to uh, persevere when you have this resilience of a people who were slated for, for national obliteration, who were slated for total uh, negation and eradication, and who stayed and who persisted and who made themselves heard and felt and are still uh, thriving. To me, this, is, this really gives me uh, <laughs> encouragement and cause to hope and to see that, that we do have a future and they will make this future. Maybe we failed, maybe my parents' generation failed, but what we succeeded in doing was to maintaining the cause alive, was in, in maintaining the narrative, in, in maintaining the spirit. Huh? And, and uh, to me speaking, not just truth to power, but speaking truth to everybody. Yes. The Palestinian people deserve the truth. They deserve to understand. I mean, they're tired of the, the language of, of uh, uh, manipulation and the language of uh, hiding facts and, and so on. They, wanted, they want to know. Many people tell me we might not agree or we might not like what you say, but we know you don't lie to us. Even Israelis say that you don't lie. It's important. It's important to stand up and speak out and therefore and speak the truth. And therefore, these I mean, this generation knows, and it knows what is needed. And in many ways, uh, uh, the, the young people do feel frustrated and sometimes they feel angry. But the moment they feel there's a chance, the moment they feel they can have a handle on reality, they can take a hold of something, uh, they can grip some sort of uh, a real opportunity for change, they will do it. They will do it. Uh, now everybody's talking about elections, organization, uh, preparing campaigns, preparing the, the, the uh, platforms and so on. Th there's an energy, but there's also along with that, there's a fear because they know that there are so many elements that could undermine this, this project, that could uh, uh, destroy the chances for free and fair elections. They know Israel can do that very easily. Uh, and um, they're, they're against all odds. They're trying to maintain this. So uh, I do have hope in, in, in the future in these young people, and I will support them. And I told them I will not run, but I will campaign for you. Wonderful. And I will speak out with you, and I will go, you know, if you want me, house to house, and I will do whatever is needed. And because they feel that my voice makes a difference, and because they feel that people believe me, uh, they, they, they do come to me and, and we do share very candid discussions and conversations, yes. Dr. Hanan Ashwari, um, I am so grateful to you personally and uh, on behalf of Rebuilding Alliance, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Can I say thank you to Donna Baranski Walker? Yes, please do. Yes, she's one woman who is really amazing. She's incredible. She's uh, I mean, works tirelessly. She's so dedicated and devoted and on all fronts that uh, I just want to say hello to Donna and thank you for everything that you do. Building Alliance is an amazing organization 
And Thank it you. does make a difference. Thank you. Much love to all of you. Thank you.